Good morning. Good to see all of you here. Appreciate you being here this morning. Beautiful day outside Alabama. 70, 20, 70. <laughs> I think it's supposed to push 80 later this week, right? I think I saw somewhere. So uh, um, thankful the Lord has blessed us with a beautiful day today. And uh, happy that you are here uh, for our Bible uh, class hour. And uh, have others, of course. Um, saw some guests walking through. So we're always excited when we have guests visiting with us. Uh, we are beginning James chapter 5 today. There are new handouts out on the white tables. Uh, if you did not get one, uh, you're welcome to get one uh, at this, uh, this time. Um, they're new as of today. Um, so uh, so uh, we'll begin James chapter 5. The, uh, or here comes Robbie. All right, if you raise your hand, Robbie will be happy to, to uh, supply an outline. Thank you, Robbie, for that. Uh, before we get into our study of uh, James chapter 5, we will um, have our prayer. A few re prayer requests. Uh, we want to uh, continue to remember the Washington family. Uh, Dennis Washington passed on Tuesday, and his funeral was yesterday at the Deerfoot Church of Christ over in Trustville. And uh, he was a young man, 49, uh, the dad of uh, one of our college students uh, here at Wood Avenue, Caitlin Washington. And I did not really know him other than a couple of times when he visited. Uh, but wow, what a, uh, uh, what a legacy he left. And uh, the guys, I think they could still be talking this morning about all the, the things that he did and, uh, for the Lord's Church on the board at Maywood and Exposure and other places. I did not know, that, know this, but he was actually a, a meteorologist, spent 18 years with Fox 6 in Birmingham as a storm chaser. So interesting life and uh, sad that it was, uh, was gone so soon. But uh, we certainly want to remember the, uh, the Washington family in our prayers. If you do not know who I'm talking about, uh, Caitlin uh, is dating Ethan Hunt's brother. So, so that can, might can help you make the connection. Preston leads a lot of our singing and devotionals here for us. Um, also, we want to remember Gene Tunnel in our prayers. Gene has been visiting uh, with us for uh, close to a year now with uh, Jane Scott. And uh, in November, he had uh, hip replacement surgery. Uh, but uh, Friday, a few days leading up to Friday, he was giving them a lot of trouble, and so uh, he went to the ER Friday night. He's actually still in the hospital, was able to visit with him a little this morning, and said it'll be tomorrow before they know if they can uh, help him with antibiotics or have to go back in, so certainly he does not want that, and so we want to remember uh, Gene Tunnel uh, in our prayers as well, and uh, seems like there's one more. I did not write it down. So it's, uh, it's not on my mind right now. I'll probably think about it halfway through the prayer. 21st, 20, Tuesday. Okay, all right. 21st, we want to remember Kim in our prayers. Uh, bi biopsy, biopsy, biopsy on the 21st. So we want to remember Kim in our prayers coming up uh, Tuesday. Yes, Charles. Mm -hmm. Charles? Sure. Oh, yes, 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 President Carter and his family. I did see where I guess he's at home on hospice care now. I did see that in the news. So uh, absolutely want to remember uh, him and our prayers in the lost. Any other prayer request? Okay, Troy Van Fleet, okay, cousin, and uh, have a kidney to be removed, and 80% sure is cancerous, so certainly want to remember him in our prayers. Any other prayer request? I did not know that. Okay, Angie had foot surgery, and she'll be in a wheelchair for four weeks. I did not, I did not realize that, so... Uh, let's see, I saw her just the other day. She was here just, just the other day. So. Just a couple of days ago. Angie Puller, certainly want to remember her in our prayers. Any other prayer request? I have a lot this morning. I apologize if I forget some, but I see a lot of you writing them down. Thank you for that. It's always good to uh, take these requests before the throne of God and uh, remember them, remember them by name when, uh, when you're able. Let me say this. Um, 
you know, it's good to do that for all the members here at Wood Avenue. And um, you can easily use your app and you know, pick out a handful a day, pray for them by name, and move on to the next one the next day. It'll do a lot of good for us to remember our members by name. Let's, uh, let's pray. Uh, our God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your blessings. And we're grateful, Father, for this new day and this new week, the opportunity to come together and to be here today and to study your word. Father, please be with us as in this class as we encourage one another, help one another, teach one another, and we'll always draw closer to you. We thank you, Father, for the book of James, and we uh, thank you for how it helps us in our Christian walk. Father, we pray that you'll be with all of our classes today. We're thankful for our teachers who are currently teaching, those who are uh, able to take a break at this time, but very much a part of uh, the, the Bible study and education program here at Wood Avenue. We're thankful for those who are here with the desire to be here at this time and this hour to study your word. Father, we have uh, many prayer requests this morning. We pray for um, the upcoming surgery uh, with uh, the kidney, and we ask your blessings to be upon uh, this surgery and the outcome of it and the health and, uh, Father, most of all, the spiritual health that uh, he and all will be strong uh, spiritually through times like this. We pray for Angie and her uh, recovery now at this time and ask you bless she and Jean uh, with, uh, with uh, healthy recoveries, quick recoveries if it's your will, but full recoveries would be uh, the greatest desire. Father, we pray for the lost and at this time we ask your blessings to uh, be with those who are seeking truth that uh, they will find it uh, in your word and that we can help to find them. Father, we pray for uh, Kim's uh, upcoming biopsy and we ask your blessings to be upon uh, her and her health and uh, that all will be well with the results of it. Father, we uh, pray for Caitlin and uh, her sister and her mom and all the family at this time and the church at Deerfoot and, and so many congregations that, uh, that Brother Washington helped and we ask your blessings to be with them in these, uh, these upcoming days. Father, uh, please uh, be with us as, uh, as we move forward and as we live each day, help us to realize the seriousness of preparation and Find joy in each day and joy and salvation of our home in heaven. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so our study today is we begin James chapter 5, the last chapter of, uh, of this book. Uh, I, I've encouraged you to read the book uh, often uh, as you, uh, as you uh, go throughout the week. Uh, you can read the, the book in probably, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, uh, or you can slow down and take longer uh, and, and spend a little more time with it. And I've also encouraged you to read, you know, sometimes just one chapter at a time. So you might want to do that uh, as we look to James uh, chapter 5, uh, the last chapter of this short uh, five-chapter book. I titled it, Don't Give Up. Um, uh, it, uh, and, and we'll see that throughout these, uh, these 20 verses of, um, you know, that's, that, that's kind of a focus here on uh, continuing to be faithful in whatever uh, we might deal with. I chose verse 11. It's kind of a theme verse for the chapter. Uh, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. But the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. The rich have been warned, as we'll see in the first six verses, They heaped up treasures for themselves, kept back wages by fraud, live in pleasure and luxury, and murdered the just. Often it is the case that the victims of evil are the innocent and, in the case of James chapter 5, innocent Christians. These poor but faithful saints of God needed to be encouraged and to remember that God is still in control. To successfully resist the oppressors, one must depend on God and the help God gives in and through the church. I think that's something that it's very important that we continue to remind ourselves, um, not taking away from God in any way whatsoever, but realizing that God has given us the church for a purpose. He's given salvation in the church for a purpose, for, that we help one another on this journey to heaven. Finally, we're reminded that there is no greater joy than when a sinner repents and turns to the Lord. That could be an alien sinner, of course. It's a case that we're going to see here in James chapter 5, an erring brother or sister in Christ uh, when turning back to the Lord. So let's begin in the first uh, six verses of James chapter 5. 
Come now, you rich, weep. Uh, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your desires are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and wheat will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. So if you're using an ESV, you'll notice that that word in verse 4 is Lord of hosts. New American Standard is uh, Lord of armies. Uh, Thayer would define it this way. Lord of the armies of Israel, as those who are under the leadership and protection of Jehovah maintain his cause in war. And so we'll see more about that and understand a little more about that when we get into verses 7 through 11 uh, when we, um, when we uh, continue to develop our study. You see a chapter division, uh, of course. We just started in chapter 5 and verse 1, but the thought is continuing from the previous chapter. And that's the case most all the time in the Bible. That's so important that we remember that um, to, to just not stop at the end of the chapter. Keep reading. Or when you started a chapter, go back and get the previous chapter or chapters. In a book like James, it's easy to, of course, um, read the entire book to get a better understanding. Uh, sometimes I will, uh, I have a Bible that um, it doesn't really have the, the, the verse division uh, uh, as we have. And that's, that's sometimes, I like reading out of that Bible sometimes. You don't focus on each verse being a, sometimes in your head, will, you'll think it's a new thought, but you can just read it through. And uh, you might be interested in something like that. Uh, so what we're reading in James chapter 5, it, um, it not only does it go back to what he was saying at the end of James chapter 4, but it's, it's the, the book itself is focused on this rich uh, versus poor and the mindset of the rich and oppressing the poor. Uh, we'll see that. Uh, throughout uh, this chapter. You know, James is condemning those who put trust in their own accomplishments. We saw a little bit of that, chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. But not just that, they're using it uh, for evil against people where they uh, should do good. Uh, in case I fail to mention this later, I'll mention it now. There's a theme that you see all the way through the Bible from beginning to end. God is very much concerned about how we uh, treat those who are not in the best position in life uh, to, um, to, to, to help themselves sometimes. Namely, you'll see the, 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 the poor, the widows, and the orphans. You, you see that throughout the Bible. And so God, with, with Israel and Old Testament, uh, with Christians in the New Testament, uh, he, he's always been concerned in, in how, we, uh, how we treat uh, uh, these three particular groups um, James chapter 1 in verse 27, uh, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Now, of course, he, he, um, you know, he, he does. 1 Timothy chapter 5, for example, you know, he, he does regulate that a little. You know? And with the widows, for example, we won't go down this path, but he says, look, you know, depending on her age, that has, that take, you must take that into account. And then also, you know, the first responsibility is, is a family to take care of. Her. So, uh, and then, of course, he's putting that on Christians um, when we have uh, those that we need to take care of in our, in our families. But um, what we'll see uh, in the first 11 verses, really, of James chapter 5 is uh, this, this was wealthy people who were oppressing the poor. They were not um, treating them fairly. And uh, some of them could have been Christians, but perhaps uh, he wasn't um, limiting this to Christians, probably just in your day-to-day -day business and that's the way it is today sometimes you know your day-to-day -day business is not always with Christians and um, so sometimes you know living out there in the real world it uh, it can become uh, discouraging sometimes when there are those who might uh, take advantage of us so what we're going to notice in this is you know don't get discouraged if you know if, if someone has, has done that to you continue to keep your faith in God we'll see that in verses 7 through 11 but don't take advantage of other people also. Uh, we'll see that in the first uh, six verses. Notice this. I picked this up from the Truth From Today commentary. 
uh, letter C, I think, I don't know, my notes sometimes are different than yours when I go back and add, uh, add thoughts, but uh, the five chapters of James contain 108 verses. Scattered through four of the chapters are 27 verses that describe either oppression directed against Christians by the rich or the Christian's response to those who controlled riches. That's about 25% of the letter. So keep in mind, if you remember however long ago it was that we studied the first uh, 13 verses of James chapter 2, and he talks about, you know, here comes in this, this rich man and this poor man, and you, you say to the poor man, oh, you go over there and you, you stand over there to the rich man, you give him the finest seat and everything based on how he looks and his clothing and all of that. And um, I, I asked a question, you know, how could this directly relate to James? And one area to consider, of course, is James was in the same household growing up as Jesus. And we know from Luke chapter 2 and comparing that to Leviticus chapter 12 that this was a household that did not have much money. Uh, you, you would even say by their offering when Jesus was in the temple at eight days old that they were poor. So, uh, you know, to me, I just think about that when I think about uh, James writing this and, you know, not just in chapter 2 but uh, in, in uh, uh, a, a lot of the book um, in the oppression uh, that the poor uh, sometimes being oppressed by the rich. Uh, again, you just think about, um, you know, that, that's likely in his life. Uh, and there's nothing to indicate of uh, at any point in time be having the, 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 the riches of the world uh, in, in James' life. But certainly he had his, had his uh, eternal riches. So, and that's what's, uh, that's what's most, most important. I, I remember a sister in Christ that passed on many, many years ago. But uh, she said, uh, she'd say quite often, I'm the, I'm the richest one in the world. I'm the richest person in the world. My father owns it all. <laughs> and so she was looking at it in that way, of course, and in, uh, in the eternal view of things. So um, notice uh, a couple of thoughts here. Notice the similar language Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount. So go ahead and put your ribbon marker there if you want. Uh, let's, we're going to jump around a little bit here at the beginning. And we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And remember in our introduction to this book, we talked about how there's, uh, there, there are so many similarities in the five chapters of James uh, to the three chapters in Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So um, we, we, noticed, we noticed the first six verses. In verses 7 through 11 of James 5, you know, he's telling the poor, you know, be patient, persevere, um, you know, don't grumble against this. Uh, and he uses Job as an example. And so he's condemning the rich in the first six verses, but he's also encouraging the poor. So see if you hear the, the similarity uh, to in our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Keep in mind, James nor Jesus is condemning wealth or having it or anything like that. They're condemning you putting your trust in it greater than God. As we're going to see in verse 24, you cannot serve God in mammon. And they're condemning when you don't do good with it with the, what the Lord has blessed you with. So uh, that's important to remember. It's not to say that we have to go out and, you know, sell it all today and get rid of it all today. He's saying do good with it. And I'm a believer that when you do good with it, the Lord will bless you with more, and you just continue to do good with it. I, I think you see that in Scripture. I think you can see that in life. Okay, in verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? You cannot serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or wealth, or riches, or money. Um, you know, again, we... God is always first, and that's important to remember. Then, notice this in verse 25. I think this kind of more so relates to verses 7 through 11 of the encouragement. The encouragement. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, uh, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither... 
uh, sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valued than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that in uh, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Have you read the story of Solomon lately? Especially when the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, comes and visits him. I mean, if you were looking at it from a, a, a physical standpoint, uh, uh, looking at uh, peace, luxury, uh, st- strong economy, I mean, that would have been some nice days to live in Israel uh, when you think about the days of Solomon and all that they had. And Jesus says, you know, that's, that's nothing. Um, and uh, in verse 30, he says, Now, if God so clothes, the grass, uh, so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Verse 33, here's here's your condition. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient is today is its own trouble. Now we talked a little bit about that um, in in, in last week, um, and how we're not saying that we should not think about tomorrow and the future and plan. Uh, certainly that is uh, not the case at all. We should always plan and use the blessings that God has given us for now and what we're uh, storing up uh, as we move forward. But um, he is also giving this, this encouragement and this reminder here to, um, you know, to, to, not, to not worry about it and um, that God will take care of us. And quite often we'll see that not only does he give us our needs, he gives us much of what we want <laughs> And uh, that is, uh, uh, we, we see that uh, as, as well. And so I see encouragement in Matthew chapter 6, the same as in James chapter 5, of um, knowing that, the, that God is in control and I'm going to keep my, my trust in him uh, regardless. I've given another example. Uh, so we see the similarity of James 5 to the Sermon on the Mount. But notice also, it's a little similar to the uh, condemnation of Israel by the prophets. And I selected Amos, for example, if you want to go to Amos chapter 3, the minor prophet, uh, with the last 12 of the Old Testament. And uh, the reason, you, you could, we could have selected a, a number of different uh, uh, passages of Scripture to see where the people of Israel were being condemned uh, because of using their riches the wrong way. I chose Amos because um, you remember in Acts chapter 15, uh, it was James, the writer of the book of James, who stood up in that Jerusalem meeting with Barnabas and Paul and Peter and the elders of the church discussing circumcision. And it was James who stood up and quoted from Amos chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, and kind of ended the discussion. You know, and I've always thought about you know, the importance of Scripture when I think of what James did. James stands up in the midst of these great men, these apostles, these elders, and he says, look, this is what Amos said. This is, this is it's, it's now, it's happened, it's come true. And, uh, and they, they, they finalized the, the uh, discussion with that. So uh, James, of course, was familiar with Amos uh, as a student of the law of Moses and the prophets. He would have been. But notice what Amos said in Amos chapter 3 and verse 15. This is when Israel is, uh, is um, getting ready to go into Assyrian captivity. Remember, the nations are divided Uh, Israel goes into Assyrian captivity in the 700s B.C. It's about 100 years later when Judah goes into Babylonian captivity. So uh, Amos was from the south. He was from Judah. But he travels across the border into the north, into Bethel, uh, to do the work that God sent him to do and uh, condemn the the northern nation Israel uh, in the work that uh, they were doing. uh, and, And we see in Amos chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. Chapter 4 and verse 1, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor. This has always been a concern of God. How do we, who are in a position to do good for others and help others. How do we 
how do we respond to that? Again, we'll discuss it as the lesson develops, not with a handout, but what is our mindset towards helping them. He talks about you oppress the poor, you crush the needy, you say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. Um, we see continuing on in verse 2, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with uh, fish hooks. So we see Amos is condemning them for this as he does in chapter 6 and verse 1. And as you see uh, elsewhere in the prophets condemning the people of Israel and Judah. So you see this, this what would become the downfall of their, their captivity, go, eventually going into their captivity. And they leave God, they leave the word of God, they leave daily living uh, in service to him as they should. They leave sacrificing to him alone in the way they should and sacrificing according to his plans. And then you see the rest that will follow, the moral uh, uh, decline in the, the nation, uh, nations of Israel and Judah. And then you see it also the, just the um, uh, 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 all around uh, the rich oppressing the poor. Uh, one of the prophets talks about, you know, your, your, your judges do it for money. Your priests do it for money. Your prophets do it for money. So it was, it was all about that, that almighty dollar that we sometimes talk about. Again, nothing wrong with having it. Nothing wrong with using it for good. Uh, but what Amos is talking about is what Jesus talked about. is what James is talking about. It's what Paul talked to Timothy about. They were serving their riches rather than God, and they were not using them uh, for good. Um, notice uh, also uh, one more thought. Uh, the law of Moses instructed the rich of Israel to not withhold from the poor. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy. Now, as you're turning to Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the, the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, the, where the law is given to the people of Israel. Now keep in mind, James might have been the first book of the New Testament written, uh, perhaps as early as the early 50s, so within 20 years of the establishment of the Lord's church. And remember in James chapter 1, he addresses to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad. So yes, they're Christians, but you're in this period of time unlike any other period of time. They're coming out of Judaism. Uh, in becoming Christians. So, so their background, these, these people, their background is Judaism. It's, it's the Jewish law. That's what they know. That's why they have certain issues continuing to come up that you read about in the book of Acts, like circumcision in Acts 15, or like um, not wanting to fellowship with the Gentiles. Because this would have, we have to understand, this would have been challenging for them. The way of life that they've always known, now there are some changes to it. And it would have been challenging uh, to give up some of that. But uh, with that being said, James, of course, uh, Jewish background, uh, would have known the law. We know that he knew Amos. He quotes from Amos. But in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 14, and keep in mind, he's, he's raised by the same people that Jesus is, Mary and Joseph. They, 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 one thing we see about these parents is they taught their children. Not to say that they were perfect parents, but they taught their children. So, you know, just all lends... Uh, to, the, to the idea that James would have uh, certainly known uh, the law of Moses. And so Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse uh, 14, beginning, You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gate. So he's talking about whether it's the people of descendants of Abraham, whether it's uh, the Israelites that are poor, or maybe it's someone who's come into your land who's not a descendant of Abraham but uh, is poor. Ruth, the book of Ruth, you remember? She, she, she was not a, a descendant of Abraham. She was not uh, an Israelite. Uh, she married into that family, but her husband dies. Her father-in-law dies. Her brother-in-law dies. And uh, she, she says, Naomi, I want to go back with you. I want your God to be my God. And, but, but what does she do when she gets back? She, she's gleaning, right? She, that's the only way that she can take care of herself and, and Naomi is going out to the rich man's field, Boaz, and, 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 and Boaz doing what the law of Moses instructed him to do, to leave the corners of your fields for the poor. God has always provided a way. And so, um, you know, so that's what she's doing. She's going out there as, day, as a day laborer, in, in a sense, uh, not to get paid from him, but to have enough food to eat that night and go back and do it again the next day and then the next day and the next day. So... Um, 
you see that God said in verse 14, you shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates. Each day you shall give him his wages and not let the sun go down on it. For he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and it be sin for you. I, I believe that's what you see in James chapter 5 uh, with these, the, the rich oppressing the poor. Uh, you see them uh, being in a position to hold back and to not, not give uh, to these who are in need. I'll not read all 16 verses of Matthew chapter 20, but I have put the reference there. I'll make a couple thoughts and then open it up to you. I know I've been uh, speaking a lot. Maybe you have comments that you would like to make. But when you see the parable of the workers in the vineyard in Matthew chapter 20 in verses 1 through 16, remember in the... Uh, uh, so he goes out the third hour, and uh, he finds those who will work in his vineyard. Uh, and he agreed. So, so he goes out in the morning, verse 1. Landowner, he went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. This is day laborers that we're thinking about from Deuteronomy 24. This would have been very familiar with the Jews, and you can see why Jesus would use it as a parable. Uh, now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them out to his vineyard. But then he does the same thing in the third hour and then in the sixth hour. And you get all the way down to the 11th hour. And of course the point is about salvation. Um, you know, there are those who near the end of life is when they obey the gospel. And we should never put it off because we never know if we have another day or not. We never know. But uh, certainly sometimes that is the case. People don't hear uh, and know what to do near the end of life. So you see that apply. But he's using that which would have been known and common for the people of that time with these day laborers. You, you pay them at the end of the day. Well, let me make a couple of comments and see what you might have to say. Let's, um, if I can read my, my scribbling. Um, let's go to the real world for a minute. Let's think about the real world for a minute. Um, not all have been taught how to handle money and manage money um, you, you see this as I mentioned a moment ago in the law of Moses and gleaning of the field some may be born into a poor family and it just, that just seems like that would be the way it was for them but God's providing a way uh, for them to be taken care of uh, they'll work they're laborers they're, they're good at it they're good at what they do that's what we're looking at in James chapter 5 these people aren't asking for a handout. They're laborers. They're working uh, for what uh, they earn. Uh, and you see that today. It might not be as much on a day-to-day -day basis in our system, but uh, you know what I'm talking about. Get paid on Friday. By Monday, there's nothing left. And that's the real world that we live in. Some, you know, so, some it's, it's that way and have never really been uh, trained uh, in any other way. So, you know, it would be easy for the these wealthy landowners and these others to take advantage of these people, to have them uh, to, you know, to work uh, for the day, but then say, well, I can't pay you today. I'm, we'll do it next week. Where, I, you know, if you see from Deuteronomy 24 through James and you see, you know, going back to that real world, it seems as if God's saying, look, there, there, there's some that you're going to be wealthy. Maybe it's passed down. Maybe you were trained how to do it. Maybe you are trained how to make money work for you. Uh, but then there's others. There's not. And, and, and especially as servants of God and followers of God, we want to work together with one another. Uh, I, I always remember around Christmas time, some years ago, shopping, you know, at the right time to shop, a day or two before Christmas. And uh, I was in a store, and uh, I'll never forget um, the guy who's checking me out. Someone else walked up to him and said, hey, man, you're, you're not going to get paid today. So I don't know all the details, but it's like it's going to be a few days before you get paid. And I remember hearing the guy uh, really depending on that for, for Christmas, you know. And I, I always just really felt bad for that guy in that case. You know, he'd been out there working. He was expecting his paycheck that day. And, but he didn't get it. Apparently, you know, just based on what I observed, it was more so the life of paycheck to paycheck. But, um, you know, and that, again, that's just the world that we live in. Um, the faithful saint, saint who is wealthy and has been taught how to make money work can be a blessing to the poor saint who never received such instructions. Again, not necessarily a handout, but the, the one who's willing to get up and work every day and, and, and labor and work, but the one who has employed him, don't take advantage of him. Give a man an honest day's pay for an honest day's uh, work. But again, you see that all around us. You see it 
in the world of athletics. You, know, you see some of, some of these, uh, these athletes, they, they're able to go, they have, they're among the, the extreme few that have the ability to go pro and they sign contracts for millions and within a few years they're broke. You know? Because they, the, the instruction, the training was never given. There were many people could take that and just multiply it time and time again. Well, again, the real world we're living in, even in the church, it's, you know, there's, there's, there's both. And God is telling us in church, you know, that, that we're not to take advantage of those who, who, uh, who have not. And also we're going to see in a moment that we also have a responsibility um, in how we treat uh, the rich in these cases. Uh, help the right way. Don't uh, hurt with a handout. Uh, these laborers uh, earn the money. If you go back to verses 7 through 11, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord, seeing how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And you see back in verse 4, uh, indeed, these wages of the laborers who mow their fields. So again, we're not talking about those who are standing there in the street corner wanting a handout. We're talking about those who went out there, worked, and earned it, but the wealthy was in a position to hold back, and take advantage of them, those who are more so dependent on that day today wages. Simply put, I know I've said a lot, and I've, wow, I've taken nearly the entire class without giving you a minute to say anything, but simply put, give the poor fair treatment. That's how I would sum it up. Give the poor fair treatment. But on the other side that we'll likely not get to today, give the rich fair treatment. We'll, we'll see both sides of that in the book of James. Okay? That's important as well. Uh, that we're given fair treatment regardless of which uh, side I'm on here. So, um, any, any thoughts or comments that you might, that you might have? Yes. Just about the question that goes towards the heart of all the things we're discussing and all the verses we looked at. Uh, in the prior stage conversation with the, uh, with the rich young ruler uh, about his soul salvation, and at the end of all that, of course, you know, he uh, explain how it's, it's hard for the rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And, and he goes on to say the other thing, but, but, but what's at the heart of all that is simply in our humility. And, uh, you know, this, this young man went away sorrowful because he had great riches. Well, you know, you can sort of examine that state a little bit. You know, why did he have to go away sorrowful because he had great riches? What's, you know, what's the problem with that? Well, Christ had asked him to, or directed him to, to share his riches. He didn't want to share his riches. Right? And so, you know, what's at the heart of all the things that we talk about, about humility and understanding, you know, how, what, what, uh, what our position is with God. That is, we're not deserving of any of the things that we have in this life. He just blessed us just so abundantly. And, uh, and so, you know, when, when we understand, like, a reference to Job, uh, you know, I've always kind of been just uh, somewhat uh, human at that commentary of Job. I mean, it's, it's all the other truth, but it, it talks about, uh, you know, you've seen the patience of Job, and, uh, and, uh, and, and you've seen the end intended by the Lord, how the Lord is very compassionate person. Well, if you look at the story of Job, what all he suffered, you know, how is it? Compassionate and merciful. Well, it's altogether compassionate and merciful because Job wasn't deserving of any of it. And so, you know, and that's, and that's the point Job came to. He was very grateful. He said, the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so, when he, when he sitting there and he, you know, with boils, and, uh, and he comes to that understanding that, hey, this is the Lord's to give and take away. And so, so I, I'm, I'm grateful for whatever it is the Lord does in my life. So then after that, you know, the Lord says, okay, thank you very much, Joe. That's, that's, what, that's what I needed to hear from you. And so then he gets 
over, but he had. He already had more than anybody else on the tour at the time. Yeah. And so, I mean, at the, at the heart of all that, it was out of the road and understanding our relationship with God. Very good, great, great comments. Wow, um, the humility uh, uh, of, of what you see in Job and getting to that point of humility and recognizing the Lord gives and takes away and the Lord then blesses him double as you get to the end of that book in the last chapter, blesses him with it more. If you could look to chapter 1 and chapter 42, everything was doubled and uh, that, uh, that's something else. And I've always wondered with the rich young ruler, you know, when he talks about his riches, uh, it, it, he wasn't doing what the Lord told him to do with it when he told him to sell all that he has and give to the poor uh, and uh, so he Matthew 6 24 right he, he loved the mammon he loved the money more than he loved the Lord at that point in time but that's one of the things that uh, times that I think uh, with him is I just wonder had he did what the Lord told him to do you know he's a rich young ruler uh, so I mean, he's he's he's, uh, he, he's he's come a long way in a short period of time um, I just always wonder if he would have, like Abraham, if he would have, quote, passed the test, shown that his faith was in the Lord and did what the Lord did. I can't help but wonder that, on the, like Job, if the Lord would have then in return would have doubled his riches or something, you know, because that's what you see in God. And then say, okay, you've been found faithful. I'm going to give you more and you keep doing good with it. And I just, I, you know, again, the Bible doesn't say, but it's just something I always wonder when I, th when I read that text. But, uh, yeah, you... you uh, you, you, you see that, um, and I heard somewhere, I don't know if this is true, you can check it, but I heard um, a preacher say once that one out of every five verses when Jesus is talking in the Bible deals with money. There, that, that means a lot. <laughs> and and we, we, we use it, we have to have it you know, in our daily living, but there, it's, just, it's the love of money is the root of all evil. It's 1 Timothy 6.10, it's so easy to get distracted by it and pulled away from it. Uh, a little over a year ago, you know, we got our young adults class kicked off, and uh, we've been having great classes, mid twenties to upper twenties, uh, at times low thirties in that class. And uh, I was able to spend the first uh, few months with them, getting it kicked off. But the first thing I wanted, and I'm grateful, some of the men who are sitting here today, uh, as soon as it was it was my turn to pass that on to someone else, I asked uh, some of our deacons, "Will you teach classes on finances in the Bible?" And they did it. And I kept telling these guys, you need to listen. You need to listen. You need to pay attention to everything they're saying uh, when it comes to the, the Bible and finances. And um, I know it was good for our, our young adults to be in those classes because, you know, the Bible has so much to say about it. And we just, again, we have to keep a proper relationship with it. And guess I have a minute or two before the bell will ring. Yes, sir? Yeah, absolutely. I want to share just about, uh, I mean, this, uh, you mentioned some of the scriptures that the you know, that have to do with our attitude towards the things that we have. You know, the first thing to say is about being content with some things that we have. And uh, but I've been in discussion with some of my kids included and others about, you know, inspiring to, to have things and to do things and so on. And, uh, and what that's all about. And, uh, and the Lord is very clear, you know, you know, having riches is not the problem, you know. And the Lord blesses you with riches, you need to be with riches, right? but you know, there is a reason for it, but it gives us just this beautiful transition of thought uh, to me where it says, you know, don't steal, but work what is good, so that you may have to give to him who has need. And it just kind of takes you in that one verse from just you, temple, right? Don't steal, work what is good, so that you may have to that's a great verse, Ephesians 4, to include in your notes. It's not in your notes, but that is a great verse to include there. Um, with, uh, and a great way to end the class today. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this class this morning. Uh, we will continue our study over the next uh, probably two or three weeks of James chapter 5. And uh, we'll have our break now and look forward to coming back together for worship at the top of the hour.